Morning. Hi, Steve. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm good. good. Thank, Thank you. you. How, are How are you? All right. I'm doing all right. Good. Looking, Looking forward, forward to this morning's, morning's meeting. Yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling these days? I'm feeling pretty good right now. I felt kind of rummy like four days ago for nearly a week, but I seem to get past that and then have about two weeks of feeling pretty darn good. Yeah. All's <laughs> well. Yeah. <laughs> We normally go for a walk around 7 o'clock or so. Yeah. Uh, it cools off. <coughs> but LA County's got a curfew at 6. Oh, yeah. So we didn't get to go for a walk last night. Uh, I'm going to heat up my coffee. I'll be back in a moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just got your uh, Slack message, so that's fine. If you're just an audio-only mode, we can talk. Susan. <laughs> Waiting for maybe a couple more people to show up. There we go, there's Dish. Hey, there he is. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Can I hear you? Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know who else is showing up, so uh, welcome to the meeting. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, does anyone have any questions or things they want to bring up before we start? Or? Oh, Susan, your audio is uh, not working. And Dick's video is frozen. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Dick's yeah. audio or video is unfrozen. Okay. As usual. Hi. Oh, there we go. <coughs> yeah, video today. <laughs> So, uh, is there something you wanted to say, Susan? You could type it into the chat. Okay. Hello. Hi. All right, how are you? Oh, yes, I'm fine. How are you? Okay. Okay, so welcome to the meeting. Uh, 
we can take if uh, I guess Mayuk is here on audio. I don't know if he got his audio fixed. If it's still not working, you can type into the chat. Um, oh, oh, there we the go. Man, yeah, there you go. Speaking of the right. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to audio because the network is really bad here. Yeah, yeah, you told me about that. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, welcome to the meeting. Uh, I think we'll start off today with uh, Mayuk and Ujwal are going to give an update on what they've been doing the last week. Oh, so last week, like, uh, I have worked on uh, some, like, I have discussed the design of building itself uh, with many people, with many peers of mine. So I get some very constructive uh, feedbacks, like, how to improve it more. So, like, I have tried to plan my activities, like, what I'm going to do for the GSOC period for the next uh, couple of uh, weeks, like, till evaluation one. So I have tried to make a plan for that. Also, like, uh, I have tried to make a uh, T. Elegant model on uh, T. Elegant model on CC 3D on the cell 3D, but I don't think so. Like, uh, the thing we are aiming for is going to be completed by CC 3D. I have tried a lot with that software. So, what I have do is I have just switched myself from CC 3D to Blender. Like, uh, Blender is like an uh, easy software to use. Uh, not easy, but yes, they are documentation and support for that. So, I guess uh, I have made some kind of membrane and nucleus for that. Okay. So, I can show it uh, yeah. after the meeting, I guess. Oh. Like, if I, I can show it? Can I show yeah. it? You might as well show it now. My screen is visible. Oh, is my screen visible? Oh, yes, yeah, it is. So, this is the model that I have tried to create using a uh, blender. So, there are multiple things uh, which is involved in creating this model. So, this is the like kind of a nuclei with a membrane here. It is a 3D nuclei which is resulting much better. Uh, than what we have done with the Photoshop. So, what I'm planning to do is like, uh, by editing these borders, we can create a kind of embryo for it, so that we can uh, make multiple clusters of it, so that, first of all, big clusters, and we can show separation of embryogenesis process, like the uh, default lines that comes in the nucleus. Uh, of C. Elegant, so that uh, then we can create a whole series of images here in the Blender itself. I have created this now. What I'm going to do is I can just replicate these results and then can connect all these with uh, in the particular pattern of C. Elegant, so that I can try to create a kind of animation from it. So this is the model, like basic model which I have prepared. All I need to do is like I have to replicate these results and collect them in order to generate the movie. Okay. So can you zoom in on that? So this is basically like uh, right now it is the outer layer is transparent if you can see, which is showing the outer membrane and below uh, inside it the nucleus that we are trying to detect using uh, our models. Well, so these can be done with both default lines and simple lines like the one showed in the YouTube video where we can see like uh, some member some uh, what I'm not getting the right word I guess but some default lines are there uh, in which they contain a nucleus that has been labeled as one two three four so we can uh, what I'm trying to do is create a membrane which should be transparent so that it will be more informative and we can reduce the size of nucleus within it to the size which is there in the movie and then we can replicate it uh, on a big scale. So is this is this supposed to be like a bunch of cells or a single cell? Like it is right now a single cell I'm trying to connect it in the forming a bunch of cells uh, connect together like uh, if you can see that C dot elegant it has some default lines and cell is created in the shape of oval. So I'm trying to achieve that. 
Is that like what's why is it why is the shape is are you taking the shape from like the data or I'm just trying to see why it's it looks kind of irregular on the edges. Like no, this shape is not from like uh, right now from data. I have just tried to experiment things. Uh, but I think like uh, in the blender itself, I am making a good progress. So yes, I will definitely going to make this shape according to data. Well, I mean, I was just thinking like it's. I mean, you could make it according to data. You could make it in a spherical. Um, but that's interesting that you can get that sort of a regular shape in Blender. I think Dick might have something to say about that, or about something, in, some feedback on this. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it looks... Yeah, so you're, basically you have like two sphere, or two spherical volumes... Uh, one embedded within the other. That purple thing is within the in the membrane. So the membrane is the outer one, which is yes. transparent. And then the inner one is this purple. Um, yes, this is going to be a cell inside yeah. it. Yeah. So it's cell nucleus, whatever. Like I have some as nucleus right now. Okay. And then the uh, object would be this is just one cell, so you could have. A bunch of cells. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It was part segmenting or as the movie part change or something. Okay. I think that's, that's, yeah, it's nice. Um, yeah, so that's, and then this is your sort of your graph of how you put this together on the bottom here. So you have, yeah. You have some elements down here. Yeah, like these are the elements like color ramp and like I have tried to give it right now uh, where on its like, texture it is like uh, converting the like, uh, sphere and a like, cube inside it into a kind of a 2D simulation. Like basically it is the uh, where the uh, texture is basically used to support cells which do for the biological development. So I have tried to use that. Uh, right now it may it might put this pair. But it is not going to be that in that way. Like uh, I can adjust the boundaries as well, like cutting some edges in the middle of and then stretching. So yeah, like these are the colors, world output, like world output I have set right now. If I can so world output like I have set like this, we can also do it in black so that it may get a more effect. And these are the different options like base colors and toughness that I have tried to uh, establish. So this is just kind of like I'm experimenting with the software, but I think like this is really good software and lots of documentation is available. So yeah, I, think, well, I think Blender yeah is a good choice if if you're gonna go in the direction of like a 3D you know, like a volumetric model. Um, and then yeah, also <laughs> yeah, volumetric model. It is better than what we are doing in uh, Photoshop because like in Photoshop we don't like, we are not actually getting the a pure, a perfect 3D model to be, let's say, like it is not a perfect 3D model. It is a, a extrude model kind of thing, like where we have extruded the image. So that's why oh, I have started to work on this. Yeah. I mean, there, there's something interesting about this, like from sort of a form standpoint. That it almost looks like when I saw it, it looked like you were modeling a whole embryo. Because of the irregularity of the surface, uh, and then yes, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm not for making the whole embryo. Embryo will be a oval shape. I'm trying to make a small segment part in between them, and then I will connect them all. Yeah, I mean cells have sort of an irregular surface too, because you have a lot of receptors and things. But that's, I mean, that the fact that you can make that sort of surface, you know, it doesn't have to be smooth, is is interesting. In the single cell, so that's good. Um, I mean, again, we're going to be, you know, probably revisiting this a lot. So, but that's I think that's good progress. Um, you also said you had some scheduling to work out, or for the coding. Oh program? yes, like uh, yes, I have tried. Like I have tried to make some GitHub issues, or uh, like some GitHub tasks for the project for, uh, like. Adding it right now. 
Okay. I was touched. Okay. Yeah, so I I just want to work now, right? Okay, yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, let me let me just present it. One second. Okay. Uh, one second, one second. Is that? Okay. Okay. Um, I think Dick has something to say. Is it coming? Uh, I see your screen. Yeah. Not coming. Uh, I think I I see a screen. Like I see. Well, I don't see your screen share. Yeah. Yeah. So I put my blog post like before the last week. What I was doing is database. The whole like where open source of this video data in my existing factor. So I used a lot of video from that and made that video like in form of time series. So the the week before last week, like this out the worms. And then I started like uh, in certain parts of the world, like for kinds of data in the head, the tail and the body, the curvature itself, right? And yeah. I try to find a way to like decompose the world of the body. You can see even the reason is okay. Like I use some image processing tools and I could decompose the body like this. Hello. Yeah, your mic is breaking up a little bit. I see your screen now, so. Is it better now? Yeah, a little bit. Yes, yes, yes. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, so this is like the... Better? Hello? Yeah, you're here. Is it is this the... Yeah, you can hear me right. Yeah. Yeah, so like then I am going to like use some image processing to, to like just um, extract the head, the tail and the contours of the like, not the contours exactly, the curves uh, the of the world as you can see. Like, so the next week, uh, that is the last week, it went on like this, wait, wait, one second. Yeah, so it was that I plotted the distance. Between the head and tail of each of two strains of the worm. That is a like I plotted the time series data in, like for the distance between the head and the tail. Yeah. And I found out that like they are they are pretty different. So then I made the model which I used to predict time series data. These days those models are used to predict log prices. Or sometimes some kind of medical data. They take in a sequence and they return to sequence. So we can use some kind of that kind of time series model in this particular domain to like maybe if as like if the distance between the head and the tail gets low and like tail means that the world is already like it's curled high. Okay. So like we can use this kind of a data. You can see the curve, right? Yeah. For now, the curve is like really not like the prediction is not really because it's just a proof of concept model. Looking at the pipeline so that I can take a lot of videos and I can be like do all this stuff. And for now, the model is not the main focus, the focus is the data. So I'll be collecting a lot of time series data, distances between the head and the tail, which time. For the models, uh, like all of them will be stored in CSV, which will try to predict the upcoming distance between hands and tails of the So that's what I'm working on right now. Okay. Yeah. Or I can, what I can also use is that the position of the world on the screen is also like it can also be stored in, in form of a time series. For time series, right? So we can use an LST in there as well to predict the like the direction of the movement of the world. Yeah. 
so these are the two things i am trying to work on like time series prediction yeah so that's it so i am collecting lot of data yeah yeah i mean that's yeah, so send it yeah that sounds good uh let me look at the chat here i think there's a message Oh, uh, that's just from Vinay. Um, yeah, I like this idea of working with time series. So, let's see. Uh, he, so, this is his blog post that he wrote for... He's writing a blog post every week on his progress. So, this is his blog post for this week, and this is kind of recaps the work. Uh, could you... Maya, Maya, could you put a link to your blog yeah. post in the chat? Yeah, I can just... I just put the main link from that you can go to the links. I'll put this link. Okay, yeah, I'll just put this link. Wait, 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 one second. Yeah, you guys can check. Okay, it has changed the blog post for now. Can we can we go back to that post? Yeah, yeah. that's pretty much it. For... Yeah. But the other link. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, let me see. Okay, yeah, actually, could you go back to the... Well, I can actually bring yeah, it up on my screen. Uh, yeah, maybe finding patterns is the one. Yeah, finding patterns. Yeah, yeah classes, right? that. Well, I, I want to look at yesterday. Yeah, yeah, go, through, go to that link. This is me. Okay. Huh? Yeah, just click on that link. Huh? What? Oh, just click on that link so we can see the post. Because uh, right now we see your homepage. Uh, should I share the screen? Should I share the screen? You can like walk through it. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. So let me, why don't I just open Can it? you just repeat what you just Yeah, I was just going to... I'll share my screen and then I'll do this. So this is... Uh, yeah, because my upload speed is also very low. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see. Can people see my screen? Okay, yeah, I'm presenting. Oh, yes. All right, so I'm going to go through, I'm going to make some comments on the blog post, but I wanted to bring it up here. We'll go to the tab here for blog post, which is loading. It's very slow. And... Yeah, the blog post is not Fully complete because I need to drop. I need to add some links there. Okay, well, let's look at it. Yeah. So this is the yeah. this is the blog post. So this is the uh, so week three. This is we're talking about the skeletonization process, and then student took a turn towards data analysis, which I mean it's probably going to uh, because you're getting data and now you want to explore it a bit. So you've got the videos from the movement database, uh, and you're just and so this is the time series, and so you were explaining yeah. to me that you've got a wild type, which is the N2 worm, and an unk mutant, which is uh, like one of the defined mutants that they have for C. elegans. So C. elegans, of course, has a lot of defined mutants. Uh, we know defined meaning that we know that every uh, worm in that strain carries a mutation in a certain gene. And so the unk mutant is uh, a certain mutation in an unk gene that they've defined and they have more definition in the metadata for the video. But for our purposes, you know, we're just saying it's mutant versus wild type. And then, yeah, we get a lot of difference here in terms of the movement patterns or in terms of this time series. So, you know, in some of the mutants, they're perfectly, nor they have perfectly normal locomotion 
but in other mutants such as this one, you see differences in in the pattern. And they're pretty stereotype patterns, so we should expect uh, you know pretty good correspondence between worms in this time series. At least I think. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what kind of data they have. Um, it might be worth maybe taking another wild type and comparing it, or getting another, you know, a couple of different types of mutants and comparing them. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, mutants as time goes, I just start out with these two just to compare and see if the thing works. Yeah, yeah. I'll add more types soon. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just kind of explaining what the, what the time series might be, you know, all about, so we have some. Basically, yeah. So why is it? Why is the unk? Oh, is is the video longer for the unk mutant or? Because like the you know this video might be longer. Yeah. The duration of this video of UNC might be longer than the previous one. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, the know. durations. I know it's not actually the durations. I guess. Um, it was something else. It was like. They were fa I was facing some kind of error, like some of the frames were corrupt, so I had made, like, in my code, there was some part which drops the frames which are corrupt. Uh, like, the ones which are, like, not loading up something. Why the only last part is there, like, uh, if you are dropping some frames, there must be breaks in the graph. Right? Well, the wild type would probably be the one where it's throwing... Like, if you are, if you are not taking breaks in the middle of the... Uh, and you are trying to append it at the last, you are not getting actual data. So yeah. it might be a duration. Yeah, I'm not actually getting it. Like. Yeah, for now this is just a prototype and I'm trying to like build this thing to a better like stage so that it doesn't drop frames later on. Right. So that's the aim right now. Okay, yeah. I'm trying to make a general pipeline which can take any kind of video and like get that time series data. So it will take a little more time. I'm working on it for now. Oh yeah, that's good. Um, and then, let's see, it is possible to generate a large amount of time series data from the videos that are available in the database. A time series can be used for two possible purposes. First would be used, uh, would be to use an LSTM to predict the future sequence of values. A good enough LSTM would be able to find an underlying pattern through the noise. So an LSTM is what, for people who don't know? No. It's a long no, short term no, no, no. memory network. It's like a network. So what it does is that the, like in a normal network, what happens is that you give it input and then it gives me an output. But in an LSTM, it gets inputs in a sequence and it remembers the context from the other older inputs. So it's contextual. It remembers some stuff. It has a long term memory going on within itself. Which actually helps you to predict the future values. Okay. Yeah, so that is like, it takes into account the other past values as well when predicting the future value. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it can take really like inputs of variable, variable lengths, like of variable time series lengths. Uh, that's good. The variable so like, 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 time series data. So basically, adding to what Mike has said, like LXP is basically a kind of a perceptron network. So what it do is like uh, whatever the previous value you are getting, it assigns the uh, you can see edges which are connected up the different perceptrons, and then whenever the new input array that as Mike has just said, like new input array comes, so it try to update that gradient again and again and then to get a normal value from all the input data that has been come. So not only the recent input data, but all the input data that has come and passed through these perceptron networks will reach uh, to the node. So every time that variable values change according to the previous one. So what we are getting is like if I have run it 100 times, so the gradient value has been changed 100 times according to the last input and have been adjusted accordingly. So like I think like uh, this is being like right now. Okay. Um, good. Uh, and then another possibility to be to use the LSTM to classify the worms stream based on the time series data. So that's like identifying things by their uh, signature, basically. 
Um, I mean, that would be useful probably for, like, maybe for developmental data as well as for movement data. Just you have a landmark in the, in the series of images. You can track its presence. Uh, you know, there's some pattern that you want to identify over time. And we could do that. Uh, that. I mean, that might, but that might also be useful for a lot of other things too. So I think that's a nice general type of uh, approach. And so this is a simple LSTM RNN, which is a recurrent neural network, on the time series data as a proof yeah. concept. So this is what the predictions. So the predictions are this orange line here, and these are the actual data. And this is thing. Like the reliability, like the further into the future the model predicts, the more are the chances to for it to deviate from the real data. So like the shorter the predictions, the better, the more reliable they are. So that's kind of thing. As you can see in the first quarter of the predictions, it's actually quite accurate, right? Yeah. You can see in the graph, right? Yeah. But on the next two three quarters, like like the next three quarters, it's not really accurate. So it kind of works that way. We can't do like very long short predictions with it. Long like long term predict. We can say like what it will be. Why the one would be after like twenty five seconds, but it can predict like why it would roughly be after like seven or ten seconds. Right. You get the example, right? So like what yeah. you can like also consider doing is like uh, not only really use uh, LST model. Like LST models are not generally used for time series prediction. So you can use some models like Arima and etc. You can uh, get uh, get tests of it from uh, by searching or reading those. Like the Arima model is basically used for time series prediction. So whatever like it is what it is kind of a statistic model which basically you if you have converted a time series data. So in the in the case of this data especially, I think like it will definitely going to give you a very better result than this. Yeah, Ujwal, can you just drop the links to my Slack, maybe, so we can talk about this later on? I don't know, sure. I don't know, sure. I don't know. We can have a discussion. Yeah, just drop the links on my Slack, and we'll talk oh. on this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, very good job. I, I like this. Uh, we can talk about this more in coming weeks, but... Uh, so this is... This has been a very productive, I think, uh, community period for both of you. Uh, we're at the end of the community period as it's June 1st. Uh, so now you have the coding period that you're going to enter into. And so this is going to be a period where you're going to, you have your uh, proposals that you wrote and now you're going to be going through the, your schedule on the proposals. And so this is much more sticking to the, well, you don't have to stick to the proposal directly, but this is where you're going to be working on what you had the deliverables that you had outlined in your proposal. So, uh, but I want, you know, I want you, if you can, to keep working on this a little bit um, and see where it goes. Um, I, you know, I think it's promising, but I also want to make sure that we have, like, we understand that there's a, like, we have to work on the deliverables that we have in the proposal that we had originally uh, set forth. Now, in terms of, like, if you have problems this summer with, and this happens all the time, this isn't just like because of the summer is weird, um, because of the pandemic, um, you can modify or rescope your proposal timeline. Uh, it happens every summer. It happened with Vinay, uh, you know, where he ran into problems in about the middle with computational resources. And that often happens when you have this sort of, when you're kind of pushing the boundaries of, uh, you know, uh, what's been done in the past. And so if you need to, you know, I, I would suggest two things. Uh, the first being that you might want to, if you have problems, uh, tell me or tell the group, uh, be, a, be transparent about your problems. If you're having like a problem with something running or something, uh, let us know. That's why we do the weekly updates. Uh, and then the other is to, uh, we will go through I think at a regular interval, maybe every couple weeks, and reassess the timeline. So I have, you know, we I give you some, uh, I have a couple of reviews I have to submit to Google for this pro for this uh, program, 
And, you know, it's like basically are they keeping up with their work? Are they doing satisfactory work? So that'll be, and that shouldn't be too hard to pass. That'll be, you know, uh, if you're coming to the meetings and, and getting something done every week, you'll pretty much pass. But if there are problems with, like, uh, you know, we have to go in a different direction, or if, you know, there's some problem that comes up, um, then we can rescope the timeline. But, I mean, you know, we want to basically stick to the timeline, but we don't want to, you know, if there are things that can't happen for some reason, then we want to be aware of those and then re sort of calibrate our timeline. So I wanted to just mention that because I know that I always tell that to uh, some of our code students because it is a pretty tight timeline and we do have a lot of sort of milestones along the way there. So, okay, good. Uh, any questions about the updates? So like, are you going to assign tasks today on the GitHub project board? Uh, well, I was going to go to that next. So why don't I go to, oh. let's see. I have two boards here, so let me go to the right one. So I have the project board for group meetings, and I have the project board for the Summer of Code. And I think I will go to the Summer of Code one first. Actually, let me share my screen. Um, so... I'm going to get through this rather quickly. Um, so this is the one for GSOC only, and then we have another one for group meetings. Um, we have a couple of tasks here. Uh, basically, it involved uh, Ujwal's Miro board, which he said he was going to use for tracking some of his issues. And then, um, I so Krishna, I talked to Krishna Friday and he wants to do this um, thing with like sort of a general biological model for machine learning where he wants to look at like all different types of images like uh, medical images, uh, plants, and animal microscopy and kind of use those in a way that would allow him to extract some very general features. And I told him, you know, it, it, it might be worth talking about it, at, presenting it about at the meeting, but it's something that is, you know, that's something that you'll have to plan out pretty well before you actually do any computation to it. So let me make a note on this. Um, biological model. And then... Uh, Yeah, so he'll have to present. I, I encouraged him to present like a proposal for that in the main meeting, and then you know we can talk about it more from there. Um, so, are there any issues that we want to add to this board? Should I go first? Yeah. Go ahead. So basically, like uh, the task on which I'm going to work is. Uh, so first of all, like uh, I have been suggested to change some colors. So yeah, work on color palette can be added uh, in progress. And there are some then. Uh, Yeah. The next task is to work on the, like, uh, some of the people have suggested, like, uh, instead of, like, spending too much time on flash page, we should be able to reach to the final model uh, in very less number of clicks. So, some changes in design scheme can be written there.
I'm not sure if I have you as a collaborator on here, but let me make sure. So those are both in progress, or? Um, after that, like, uh, finalizing the whole design uh, front end? Yeah. And then we have to set up the framework. Uh, uh, I have uh, decided our uh, uh, pros and cons, and then finally come like we are going to use Django for the framework because most of our things are built on Python. Okay. Then next task would be like uh, whatever the front end we have created, uh, we have to integrate static files there. A lot of static file integration will be going on. So would that be integrate what? Uh, static files. Static files. Oh, okay. Then in we have like uh, to work on tables of development. Like create pages for Devozu and demo modes. Yeah. We can actually reorganize the Yeah. Let's put that. I mean, these are just kind of like placeholders, anyways, because we're going to get. We'll just do like, uh, you know, I don't... I, we can do this offline actually, a lot of the populating of this, but I just wanted to put a couple of them in here just to make sure we have them. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, that so that's good. We can we have those in there. So that so now we have some of those in to do, and I think two are in progress. Um, so the way it usually works is that we have our in progress is like something that we're doing, uh, you know, that that we're kind of coming up on and we're making good headway on. And then we put that in done when we're done. So this one actually is done, the office hours discussion section. That's something we did, uh, I think, two weeks ago, uh, where we talked in, in office hours in Slack about the project, about the summer project. Uh, movement, movement tracking, machine learning. Why don't I assign that to, uh, this will be, so that'll be in progress. Um, assign that to see Mayoka in here. Uh, I think I sent it. Yeah, I'm actually working on movement tracking and prediction. So you can add that in. Okay. Movement tracking and prediction because it will predict the model. Alright. Oh, it's not already. Movement tracking and prediction with yeah. some better, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's good. I don't know why you're not coming up as a collaborator in here, but we'll, yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, so I mean, like, if you guys want to add to this board yourself, uh, you can do that, and then you can assign yourself to tasks. Otherwise, we can do this in the um, in the meeting. But I'd rather do it offline, actually. Um, and then this is actually this one. I think I can assign Krishna because he's on here. So that's that's something that's on. And then uh, I think that's it for now. Again, we'll be revisiting this board in the near future. Now I wanted to go to the group meetings board. Actually, I don't think I'm going to go to the group meetings board. I think we've. Well, no, let's do that. Let's go to the group meetings board. Um, so we have a bunch of issues here that are outstanding. And sometimes I repeat myself on some of these because we don't move on the issues. But at some point, we'll move on the issues. Uh, so in progress, we have axolotl embryo animations and segmentation. So. This is still on hold. This is something that we would like to revisit. Um, and 
Susan said that she was interested in sending more data our way, so uh, or my way, so that we can uh, do more with this. But we haven't. We're still kind of on hold with that issue. Um, and again, if people are watching online or in the meeting here, are interested in moving, you know, moving this forward, we can uh, put move this up in the queue of things to do. Um, the revisions for the Basel area paper. So those have been addressed. I was addressing them this week with. I think I had to get some content from Ojwal, and I got. I I think the thing about the. PCA was actually my uh, responsibility because I put that in there. So I fixed that and I'm going to resubmit it to um, uh, Dr. Cohen who emailed me a couple weeks ago for the revision. So I think they're in a good place. Um, I don't know if I have the link to the Google Doc. If you want to take it a look one last time, I can send the Google Doc link out, and we can uh, you can look at it one last time. But if there hasn't been much change, it was just some uh, small changes to it. But that's well. So we'll send it to him, and I think it's accepted at this point. So he said that if we just make those changes, it'll be accepted. So so that one, I think we can just put in finished, more or less. Um, Present on multi-cell systems, I'll do that in a, in a while, but that's something that uh, is something I was working on. Um, Revitalize Friday's coffee hour hackathon. So this last Friday we had one of these events, a coffee hour, and if you're interested, it's at uh, 4 p.m. UTC, which is um, in the late morning in North America, and in the evening, I think, in India. And uh, in Europe, it's probably late afternoon, early evening. So uh, we do it at a different link, uh, but I, I, I can send you the link if you're interested. Otherwise, it's in our Slack channel often. And so we, we, we had a good discussion last week. I, I talked to uh, Krishna and I talked to um, Jesse about some things. And so that's a good opportunity to have a very relaxed uh, you know, sort of technical tying loose ends together meeting. And so we have, then we have complexity measures, which is a different issue. This is something that Jesse expressed interest in last week. So I sent out an email <coughs> with some information. So I kind of, this is something that Dick and I talked about a long time ago. And uh, I put together some things in a, in a Google Drive directory here. Um, so these are things that I found in sort of like my hard drive folder and then a couple things that I've added into it. So this is uh, this was initial BRCH uh, which is one of Dick's codes for the projects he's working on. But this is, uh, so it has a bunch of different things in it. Uh, there's some stuff on metabolic scaling, information measures, some stuff on differentiation trees and then we have this document which i don't know looked like something that was like started and yeah so this is something dick wrote here uh complexity measures for branching structures applied to differentiation trees and diatom crystals and so this is a uh, sort of a I don't know. I mean, it's sort of a start to some sort of article or a uh, comment. Let's see. This is uh, something in the chat. Oh, okay. Mikolovs George Mikolovsky is interested in complexity measures. So, yeah, I know that he gave a talk in the group a while back, several weeks ago, on his... Um, and the talk is on our YouTube channel, if you missed it, um, where he talked about complexity measures. Actually, he talked about complexification, which is something that his, his sort of specialty is written a number of papers on it. So we'll actually have to put some, maybe bring him into the loop on this a bit and see. But we, we're kind of in early stages of this. So, 
I mean, you know, kind of getting on the, at least in this format. Um, the create a doc for open collaboration papers. That's actually done because I put that up on the um, readme of our group meetings GitHub. So if we go to group meetings, we have a uh, readme here, and this contains all the group paper links. So these are things that if you find interesting, you can click through and either request permissions or you can maybe issue a pull request if it's a GitHub repo. Or, you know, there's some you can submit even via email if that's what's more comfortable for you. Um, uh, let's see. Create DevOML on Google Classroom. That's been done. Schedule presentations. I think that's been done for now. I'll probably make a new issue on that. This copy cell 3D model. I think we'll put that in finished. I think Ujwal's uh, going to try. Um, actually, we'll make that issue. Um, in um, Blender. So Ujwal is going to use Blender for that, at least for now. And, and we'll put that in, in progress because we just saw that demo. And I think that's it for now. I think things, uh, community period activities for GSOC, that's done. Organized Devo Zoo, we'll just put that in. Um, oh, we'll keep that in here. So I think, and then the axolotl montaging is in on hold. So I think a lot of this stuff is just kind of stuff I put up here uh, to sort of mull over and think about. But uh, we'll, you know, if you have an issue, you can either put it up here yourself or you can point it out. So uh, via email or, you know, whatever. Is, are there any things you can think of that we need to put up here as, as issues? Okay, so it's a lot of things get like kind of shoved down to the <laughs> down the queue, and it's like we, that's why I kind of review this board so we can refresh our memory on things. Anyways, if if we have things that we want to put up there or bring up to the top of the queue. Yeah, let me know via email or Slack or whatever media you media me like to, uh, and then we'll you know bring it up in the queue. So that's good. I think we've got a lot done today. Uh, I wanted to go over last last bit of business. I wanted to go over some papers. Okay, any interest in origin of life via shape droplets? Well, we had so we presented on this a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is the shape droplets work that he was uh, presenting on, and uh, why don't we put that up as a as a an issue so we can revisit it? Um, but if you haven't seen his presentation, I would go take a look at it. I think it's like two or three weeks ago. If you go to the uh, YouTube channel and you look at the videos, you'll see that underneath I've put like descriptions of what's in each week. So you'll be able to find it that way. Um, and if you're interested in, like if you can think of things that are related to it or you're interested in pursuing it, maybe like a computational model of it or something, you know, we'll definitely want to talk about it. So we'll put that in uh, hold, maybe, so we can get some. Maybe if someone's interested in talking about her, that's actually what I was going to present on the uh, the multi-cell systems, but I didn't uh, do that this week. But we'll do that in maybe a couple of weeks. I I had a busy week last week, so. So the final thing I'd like to talk about today are these two papers. Um, Betsy, <laughs> because uh, I have 270 images of Archaea that may be worth shape analysis. So
So that's a, yeah, that would be a good opportunity, maybe in terms of data analysis. Um, it might be a little too small for uh, for machine learning techniques, but it like maybe like I don't know if you can use if they're time series images or if they're just static images, but we might be able to do something interesting with them because your the shape analysis, of course, is different than like your uh, typical type of. I mean, well, I guess it'd be feature selection, but supports archaic first hypothesis for Luca. Yeah. So, we're, you know, we would be testing a scientific theory here in this case. Um, so, I just, and then I'm going to go through these papers really quickly. Um, I just wanted to point them out as I do when I do this every week or two when I do this uh, review. The first one is, uh, and just to make people aware these papers exist, not that I want to uh, analyze them extensively. Uh, the first one is Cell-Cell Interaction and Diversity of Emergent Behaviors. So this is something that was published in IET Systems Biology. Um, and this is, uh, so the abstract here is, despite myriads of possible gene expression profiles, Cells tend to be found in a confined number of expression patterns. The dynamics of Boolean models of gene regulatory networks have proven to be a likely candidate for the description of self-self organization phenomena. So they're taking the gene regulatory networks of these cells and they're turning them into Boolean models, which are the zero one, you know, where you flip a bit and that's indicative of a state change. Um, because cells do not live in isolation, but they constantly shape their functions to adapt to signals from other cells. This raises the question of whether the cooperation among cells entails an expansion or reduction of their possible steady states. So multi-random Boolean networks, which is something that they use, are introduced here as a model for interaction among cells that might be suitable for the investigation of some generic properties regarding the influence of communication on the diversity of cell behaviors. So they have, I think we talked about cell-cell communication a couple of weeks ago. And then this is another model for this. This is what they call multi-random Boolean networks. So in spite of its simplicity, the model exhibits a non-obvious phenomena according to which a moderate exchange of products among adjacent cells fosters the variety of possible behaviors. And so, and I guess it pushes the behavior of the cells towards one another. So. Basically, the cells are communicating, and the communication modifies cell behavior in such a way so that it's more homogeneous across cells. And so, and then a more invasive coupling would lead cells towards homogeneity. And so, let's see if they have a picture of or a diagram of this model. So the model is a, it's a mathematical model. Um, we have a model of molecule sharing and molecule signaling. Uh, yeah, they don't have any diagrams. Usually I like to see those to show what they're talking about, but and then they have this graph of coupling strength over time with different types of signals and sharing. I see. Um, so that's one paper. Let me put a link to this in the. Uh, this should be share. This, this folder should be share all. Let me put this in here. And then uh, let's see. So Stephen McGrew says Kaufman's work and Wolfram's work relate to this. Yeah, I think Kaufman and Wolfram have done a lot of work in this in this uh, direction. The Kaufman with like NK landscapes, which are these landscapes of fitness. Uh, and then we have Boolean networks, so they're like networks of different nodes that have a the Boolean state, a zero one state. And then Wolfram's doing a lot of stuff with like uh, networks and and computational complexity now. He he wrote that huge book on cellular automata, but he's actually moving towards what they call multi-way systems, which are 
um, you know, uh, it's like a network, but they're uh, special properties. So it's interesting, uh, that sort of complexity approach. And then this is a paper, finally, and I've given giving it, you know, maybe a couple minutes here. And it's probably worth more than that. I think this is something that Susan sent on uh, Xenopus development from late gastrulation of feeding tadpole in simulated microgravity. So this is uh, not modeling. This is an experimental paper. So the abstract uh, says, microgravity is known to influence cytoskeletal structure but its effects on cell migration are not well understood. To examine the effects of altered gravity on neural crest cell migration, we inserted Xenopus lavis embryos, which is a frog, in two separate uh, microgravity simu simulating slow turning lateral vessels. And so these are things that, these are actual vessels that they put them in that have a microgravity. Uh, so they suspend most gravity. There's like very limited amount of gravity in them, uh, just before neurulation. So this is in stage 11 to 12 of the frog embryo. So this is different than the C. elegans embryo, a much different sort of uh, developmental set of stages. And expose them until feeding stage, stage 45, when the jaws and branchial apparatus are fully functional. So they're basically putting in microgravity when it's forming a major part of its uh, anatomy. And so to evaluate apparatus-related artifacts, we use two different STLVs and a vibration control as well as a stationary control vessel. So they're controlling for uh, effects of vibration and things like that. So Susan Crawford Young, uh, let's see. Susan says, the vibration of the vessels had an influence on the neural crust by itself. Yeah, that's why they did the control. And that's a lot of times in cell biology, they have like, you know, they do controls for things like that <laughs> because it'll be, you know, they'll, you can't uh, rule out, you know, certain things, certain artifacts that you think are, you know, you think you have a nice finding and you find out it's something like that. So they try to run as many controls as they can. Um, and so... Uh, let's see. Larval growth pattern of NCC-derived cartilage formation and incidence of malformations were analyzed using immunolocalization and home out staining of cartilage with LC in blue, which is where they stain the cartilage uh, to, to show, you know, where it's forming. Um, the two STLVs often yielded different or conflicting results. Many differences, such as increased cartilage size, attenuated Hox A2 expression, and increased cell division, may be attributed mainly to vibration of the rotating vessels. However, tadpoles that developed in sim simulated microgravity, uh, both STLVs but not the vibration control, showed significantly more skeletal abnormalities, with stronger effects on cartilages derived from NCCs, those derived mainly from mesoderm. We conclude that migrating NCCs of Xenopus are sensitive to the altered gravitational environment. And studies relying on bioreactors to simulate microgravity also need to take variation in apparatus into account. So they did find a pretty significant uh, effective vibration. So Susan, what were your thoughts on this paper? Oh, <laughs> you'll have to type it in. I, I don't think your sound is working. Yeah, more work on vibration needs to be done. Yeah, I think that's in developing embryos. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, like, I know that there's a lot of, uh, some work that people have done on, like, stem cell differentiation and force, forces in cells. So, in other words, like, they have, uh, they've done work where they've, like, looked at, like, what, if they, um, uh, 
implement forces on cells, like rotational forces, or sometimes they'll put them on different surfaces on, in the uh, culture dish, and they have to adhere to the different surfaces. But that has an effect on the differentiation of, or the trajectory differentiation of stem cells. So, like, they'll put stem cells in different types of patterned uh, surfaces where they culture them, and it'll actually have an effect on how they differentiate. Uh, and furthermore, they can add like forces to the uh, culture, and they can actually observe changes in how uh, differentiation the differentiation program unfolds. And we know that stem cells are you know, what they call multipotent, so they can go down a number of different pathways. Um, not only of like regular like somatic cells, but they can also go down like cancer pathways, uh, just because you know when you they have a normal sort of program, but they have to have environmental factors that also contribute to their differentiation. And so when they don't get the ones that they're used to in development, uh, they can go down different pathways. You can induce all sorts of things in them. Have you done like any work with that or have you, are you familiar with that area of research? And I mean like the vibration work, not just any, you know, Oh yeah, the vibration work for your thesis. So your thesis looks like it's going to be pretty good. Uh, you're doing all this advanced math and then... <laughs> Okay, so you're vibrating an embryo to get a look at the rheology. So, and then for those people who don't know what rheology is, can you can you give a good definition? I mean, I know what it is, but yeah. it's viscosity. Okay, so. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's like related to the physics of fluids and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, that I think people have looked at that, like, the, I think they know there's something going on there, but no one really knows what it is. Um, and, you know, it's, it's that cells, of course, sense their environment, but, they go beyond that, like, people have not really been able to go beyond that, I don't think, at least in terms of, um, you know, a predictive model. Yeah, forced due to fluid movement. Yeah, exactly. So this is, uh, you know, when you're, you have a cell on, a bunch of cells in a fluid, which they are, of course, in biology, you have these forces, and they, of course, have an effect on the cells, their development, and then, and, you know, cells would, they'll, you know, they'll experience forces, their fluids flowing through your body all the time, but, like, sometimes those forces are not what is normal in the normal operating range, and so, yeah.
Okay, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, we try to be pretty accommodating. We have a lot of technical issues, as you can tell from today. Uh, but yeah, I think that's good. Uh, thanks for everyone for our meeting today. We're at the, past the top of the hour, so um, Dick had to go to another meeting. So, but uh, we'll be on for next week. Yeah, stay safe. Have a good week, and um, talk to you later. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. All right, bye. Bye. bye.